Okay. Um, so the ideas that we wanted to talk about this morning are do, 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 point work, and then we also wanted to talk about um, different extremities. Okay, so yesterday we did the ear demo, and one of the things that, again, you you saw while we were moving things through the ear was that, you know, the idea that we chose the ears just because it's, it's accessible, it's easy, um, but also because it's an undervalued extremity. A lot of people don't go to the ears, like a lot of reflexologists will go to the feet first and foremost. They won't choose the ears because ears are not taught in a lot of traditions. But when we're looking at the four major extremities, we know as reflexologists, even if somebody's coming in with plantar fasciitis, like we can address that through the face, we can address that through the hands. It doesn't need to be extremity specific for a particular issue, but there is that dynamic of if somebody's coming in with plantar fasciitis and they're expecting to get their feet worked on, you always wanna work within the client expectation. But like we were dealing with low back stuff, we were dealing with knee stuff, we were dealing with trauma, like all of the things, like genuine trauma, um, all of the things that are very appropriate for reflexology to work with. It's just, you know, it might be fun to switch it up, especially if you're hitting a wall with a client to choose another extremity. Um, but the point work aspect is really where um, reflexology shines. So after you master a basic routine, so you go to school for reflexology, for massage, I mean, the, the whole process, or even like any job, you master the daily tasks, you master the processes that you need to do to get the job done, which for us is going to be the, the routine that I'm teaching you. So we start with the relaxation techniques, we go spine, toes, dorsal aspect, ball, digestive, back to toes, around the ankle, you know, and finish with relaxation techniques. Like that's our canned routine. But the routine is not the work. The routine is just to get you from point A to point B. It's to get you to not leave anything out but to, to feel every area. Like the analogy is you're going to the zoo, I want you to see every exhibit because you never know when the lions are like dancing on their heads or something like that. You just don't know what's going to happen at the zoo that day. And clients are definitely a zoo within themselves. So we want to make sure that we're not getting locked into a box of like the reflexology books will tell you, somebody has a headache, press X, Y, Z, if you follow that approach, that's going to eliminate certain areas that you might not expect, which may be totally involved. Like yesterday, we were working with, you know, the, the direct issue was knee, which when we think of areas of emphasis, we would, all, we would work all joints in that area of emphasis, but maybe a practitioner who doesn't know that, that theory of areas of emphasis, they might just be jamming on that knee reflex maybe into the lower back reflexes. There may be some referral sensation because they they would be hitting vertical zone one, which would be the influence of the neck. But if we were to clear out every zone, we would have found and felt anyway, actually what George was feeling on the table with, uh, with her yesterday. You had noticed, you said the toes feel stiff, they feel rigid, they feel um, restricted. And so that, that was an echo of what we found. Actually, the body was, was demonstrating pain in an area that wasn't the true source of the tension. So that's where point work comes along, is we're using the routine to make sure that we're staying on, like staying focused on covering the entire extremity. But then as we're visiting the various exhibits, as we're visiting the various reflexes, we then realize that there's a fire that we need to put out or we realize that something just isn't happening in that area, like the manatees are sleeping. Um, we don't need to stay here for three hours in order to you know, have a good time. So somebody comes in and they complain of XYZ issue, but throughout the course of the routine, you visit XYZ reflex and nothing's happening there. What do you do? You know, if you're not properly trained as a reflexologist, you might freak out and be like, well, I'm not seeing anything. This is the end of my career. Like I'm a terrible practitioner. 
And that's not the case. The body is always going to direct you to exactly where you need to be because it's infinitely intelligent. And then when you get there, you implement the point work because the point work is you communicating with what the body is telling you to deactivate the stressors, right? So we found weakness on one side of the lower back, tension on the other side of the lower back, classic compensation pattern. But then when we got to the neck area, there was so much congestion. So my version of point work was literally pulling out that congestion. But then on the opposite side, I stayed in that one zone for a good 10 minutes because that's what, what was needed. Like the points weren't releasing and that's where the body told me that I needed to be. So we did the point work, but you know, 35% of the session was in that one area, you know, of the five zones on either side of the 100% of a session, we spent a third of it in one zone, you know, because that's what the body dictated to us you know, during the session. And that's, that's where the point work starts to come in. So they're, hey, hon, come on in, make yourself at home. Um, little, little pre, pre reflexology conversation. So let's talk about the, the various aspects of point work. Um, so when you find a reflexology point, which is the real, um, the real staple of the practice, in my opinion. So the routine is like level one. So you're learning the routine, you're getting things down. Once you start to not focus on what you're doing with your hands every two seconds, you start to feel. And once you start to feel, you start to notice that certain textures are different from others, right? Mm -hmm. But then what do you do with those points? So let's kind of walk through the technique of what, those, what that procedure looks like. So there are three major aspects that I want you um, to, to focus on. So first, when you, when you find a point, when you find an active reflex point, that, that varies in sensation from person to person. Some people describe it as like a static, like an electrical feeling. Some people refer to it as like a magnetic, like I, I know during a session when I walk over a certain point, like my thumb does not want to leave that place. Like there's a pull in that area. Sometimes it can be uh, some of the elemental signs that we've we've talked about. It could be excess heat. It could be weakness. It could be just in a gut feeling of like, ooh, that's not right. Like we need to stay here for two seconds because this is raising a red flag in my mind. As you know, you as the practitioner are trained to kind of work with. It's it's very much and you know even if you're not a practitioner like. Your mom's senses are tingling. Like you just, you just know when something's not supposed to be there, you know, when something's out of place. So the first thing that you want to do is engage the point. And that means you're going to stop and you are going to apply an even amount of pressure. When I say even, that's going to be the three to four out of 10 in pressure on the lighter side of the spectrum, but not light enough as to not engage the nervous system. So you're really going to be applying that evenness to the place. Hold it with a certain amount of pressure to start the conversation. That's the goal. Is the body told you that something was going on here and so it's your job to stay there and figure out what's going on. So the engagement aspect is you consciously being aware of what you feel, stopping and engaging the point to start that, that conversation, that dialogue. And then the next step is going to be to listen. So after you apply that pressure, what is the reaction that the body gives you? So there are a couple different things that could happen here. Uh, do, 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 do. E, A, S, E, and nothing. Okay, so the first the first response will be the tissue will guard against you, okay? So it will often um, lift up against your pressure and create a defensive wall of fascia, basically, against the point, almost, against your pressure. Almost as if it was trying to block it. Exactly, as if it was trying to say, please don't touch that. Um, and, and that's okay, that's a good thing. Hey, make yourself at home. Um, so the, the guarding response is okay. 
but that does mean that either you you need to back off or that the point was not appropriate so even though the body was doing some construction work in that area the reflex itself may be valid but the problem is that when upon addressing the actual point the body is having second thoughts and being like whoa that's a little bit too sensitive for me so your response is either to back off or to to kind of stay there and see if the body calms down a second if it doesn't then then you move on okay. number two is going to be the body actually releasing so after you engage the body will let go and it will discharge that tension okay. this will often feel like the body is welcoming you in like it will separate the ocean of tissue and allow you to actually fall deeper into the point that you're working on and this is a very beneficial um this is a very beneficial action because it means that the body is kind of pulling you deeper and allowing you to actually access a point maybe from an, a different angle or getting out of kind of its own way to let your pressure do the work that it's supposed to, that the body was basically asking for. Yeah. But then very interesting is the, the third response would be the body actually doing nothing. Um, so you engage the point, but nothing really happens. Like the body's not guarding against you. It's not letting you in. It's just kind of sitting there. Um, and that's okay too. But after about 15, 20 seconds of the body doing nothing, move on. Because that means that the point, the point was not supposed to be pressed or it was not relevant. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the ongoing dialogue is even though the body may draw you into a certain point, there may be activity there, but it may not be, the body may not need your help in that area. It's very much, you know, the struggle of therapists everywhere. You, uh, there is a problem going on, but it's not your job to fix it. Uh, you know, and that's, that's when nothing happens is the body saying, you know, you're right. Stuff's going on, but you know, nothing to see here. Move along. I got this. Yeah, exactly. I got this. This is perfectly fine. Um, so your action will be based on that response. If the guarding occurs, your job is to pull back a little bit and see how the body again responds to that new level of pressure uh, or if it releases you will then go deeper and allow yourself to kind of fall down that rabbit hole into the point in question or if nothing happens you move on so that dialogue gives you what you what information you need to treat the point effectively then we can get into subtler aspects of kind of the intuitive work. What does, when you feel a point, what, what does it feel like it needs? Does it need a circular pressure? Like, does it need to be, to be um, moved around in a circulatory way? Yesterday, I was, I was pulling a lot of things out of the point. So I was literally locking into the point and dragging open the tissue, not, not in an aggressive way, but just as the body dictated for me to move in that direction um, and then in some points like at one point I used the nail of my finger because the ears are small and they require that kind of nuanced delicate work um, but I needed to get into a very a very finite point in order to deactivate it based on what the body was asking me to do my little my little finger bone although it's small it wasn't small enough to hit it at just the right way so I used my nail instead, and normally I don't do that. Like that's a no-no for me. Um, but in the in the process, that's what the body required. And this is where we get into the conversation of you know clients come in and they fall on that that pressure spectrum. Of some clients can barely take any pressure whatsoever. Other clients, you have to go through the foot in order for that or the extremity for them to even start to feel it. And then most clients end up somewhere in the middle. So with point work, you're, it's a dialogue. It's not uh, a chart in a book that you can memorize in order to say, this is good, this is bad, this is what you need to do, this is what you don't do. Because two clients will never be the same. Two points will never be the same. You deactivate one point on a client one week, they come back the next week, it's totally different. 
Some points may be the same, especially if it's a chronic long-term issue, but most of the time they change. Okay. Does that start to make sense a little bit? So that's the guard release and nothing that corresponds to listen? Yeah. So it's once you engage the point with an even amount of pressure, then you're listening for the feedback and adjusting your action accordingly. Yeah. And then you're basically waiting. You're continuing the dialogue process until the body finally calms down. It's very, it feels very much like the tissues settle um, and the point has been released. And that's, that's when you truly move on. Do you only assess that physically or energetically? Both. Um, uh, this, this goes back to our four, um, the, the four signs, uh, I'm to make it sound really, really fancy. The four signs of reception, um, which sounds like a really secretive technique or book or something like that, something very metaphysical, um, but it's, it's the four signs that the body is receiving the work. Uh, when we're when we're doing body work of any kind, but reflexology specifically, so the facial the facial itches, the muscle twitches, the breathing changes, and the stomach gurgles. Um, those are the four main things that we look for when a client is on the table and we're moving stuff around, and the body is adjusting, and the body is releasing tension, and the body is starting to receive the work. Those are our four signs of reception. So right. as you're moving stuff around in the points, you're looking for those things. And that tells you that you're getting close to... The your, facial twitches, stomach mm -hmm. gurgles. Uh, breathing changes, and facial itches, muscle twitches, stomach gurgles, breathing changes. Yeah. Facial twitches, breathing changes, stomach gurgles. Facial itching. That's different than facial itch twitches? Itching twitches. Well, twitches are... That's muscle twitching, okay, but facial, so like, itching so just the face. general mus muscle twitching. Right, exactly, wherever that occurs. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a, a fifth one I got last night. Oh, yeah. There there are many other, other subtler ones. Well, I guess you could classify it under muscle twitches, but it really wasn't. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, yeah. The, like, ab, one thing um, I'll see a lot is the clients will have temperature changes, which we experienced yesterday. Um, at, tearing of the eyes the eyes will actually release tears or sweating or sweating yeah i mean all of those are valid but these she are the... sweating yesterday on her neck yeah. yeah exactly i i and again it's awful i know it's terrible it was very dramatic um <laughs> but that all of those things are very very much a sign that we've moved something that the body is going into a self-healing response um which may be pleasant may not be pleasant um, but it means that we've addressed the point successfully and the body has taken that and ran with it to do whatever it needs to do to heal. Is that, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll share what I, I, I worked on a friend of mine last night. Okay. He's some, someone who's on his feet all the time. He's yeah. a hairstylist, does yeah. color and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes off right away. Yeah. But it wasn't too long into the process. It's like he's never had any work done at all. Mm -hmm. And I, and the more I got into it, the more it's like all of a sudden the, his uh, right foot was like enlightened and awakened. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, this is interesting. Yeah. And it had a life of its own. And it was actually like having a dog, a lap dog, purring and cuddling up against me. Yeah. Especially when I started working on the other foot. Yeah. And he was dead calm, so out of it, snoring. Yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah. It was like, you know, and, and it fits in my own for me is we're owner operators of this body and it has its own consciousness sentience, yeah its own mm -hmm. consciousness and the body was basically telling me i like you it's like curling up and right it was like a kitty cat yeah <laughs> it, was curry. it was really cool all of it yeah. so, so i guess that would be under the fifth sign of miscellaneous <laughs> miscellaneous <laughs> signs of reception um that's volume two <laughs> the same issues of transference and countertransference with reflexology like you would with general massage? Yeah, transference, countertransference, yeah. definitely. Um, uh, what the problem that I have with, oh, uh, we're about to go down a rabbit hole. Um, so this got posted in the foot reading uh, and reflexology community 
uh, on Facebook recently where somebody, a new member, came forward and said, you know, I have energetic experiences during a session when I work on people in the form of hot flashes. Like, what does this mean? And like 13 people jumped on the thread and they're like, you know, you have negative energy. The client has negative energy. Like this, you know, this situation is, you know, need for energetic grounding and protection and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, transference, countertransference is very much that. Like the idea of taking on somebody else's pain is a attractive uh, form of kind of shamanic practice in some instances, but then it's also a feared practice in other instances from body workers who don't necessarily have that acceptance or confidence in, in what they're doing. Um, but a really great example of that is I'll have clients come in to see me for the first time and a part of my body will start to hurt that normally doesn't start to hurt. Um, and that's my body warning me what's about to come through the door. It's, it's a very cool experience. But likewise on the table, like you've experienced this in class, like your face will start to itch. Yeah. Your muscles will start to twitch. Like you'll start to get hot or cold. And that's your body communicating with their body through what's known as mirror neurons. So your nervous system is communicating on a very subtle level. And we'll talk about this more on the sensory system as well. Um, and it's producing the transference, countertransference in, in both ways. You know, you're not the only person getting worked on in that room. And I, I firmly believe that uh, because the session dynamic, you know, we are not these magical healers that, you know, poof, you're healed and it's a one way street. You cannot. And this is this is an interesting theory, interesting concept, because a lot of body workers will say, I feel so drained after I give a session. Well, you're not giving a session, you're also receiving Absolutely. a session. So are you fighting your own work? Are you fighting the work working on you? And that's a very powerful statement. So that idea of transference, countertransference, I think is super relevant, especially when we get into the symptomology of what happens when we address points correctly. And that movement, sometimes it freaks clients out. Like sometimes we're bringing up pain to the surface so that's all, that's all part of the package. But as long as you know how to handle that appropriately and to kind of step back and be like, what is exactly happening here? We as reflexologists are working with the nervous system. We need to be more open to weirdness happening during a session because the nerves can do very crazy things. Um, like I, I had mentioned the other day, I had a client come in for a half hour session and her entire left leg went numb. Uh, so how do you explain to a client that has never experienced a sensation like that, that that's actually a good thing? And it means that the body is rebooting that nerve channel during the work. Because it doesn't matter how many times you fix the bolster, the nerve will still go numb because you're inducing a healing response. You know, so, but you have no control. Like, it's not like you press the numb the leg button. Right. That's not how it works. So being open to, you know, witnessing the body's beauty, really, and uh, stepping back and like being like, okay, I don't know what's happening here. I hope it's a good thing. If it's not a good thing, you tell me, or I'm going to tell you, and we'll address it then. But otherwise, we're just going to like let the infinitely intelligent body guide the show for two seconds. And that's really all we're doing with point work is we're having a manual conversation with a highly intelligent clump of tissue that's then giving us advice on how to fix it. That explains the voices too. Well, just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> that explains the voices. Well, <laughs> might want to get that checked out. Um, okay, so let's. Is my eraser up front? My eraser's up front. It's right. Oh. Well, it is in front. More coffee. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about flavors of extremities and kind of go into that rabbit hole uh, of the flavors of the different extremities. So we have feet, hands, which we did feet yesterday, so now we're on to hands, face, and ears. Okay, so the question continues to be asked, when you study multiple forms of reflexology, 
what extremities do you use, what extremities are appropriate, is one extremity better than the other, what happens when markers manifest on one of the extremities and they don't manifest on another. Um, the body is extremely intelligent with how it chooses to place its markers and in what extremity it gives affinities. As an example, I, you know, my business is the Foot Whisperer Reflexology Institute. People know me to work on feet, mostly. I do work on clients with hands, face, and the ears, but a large majority of my client base are expecting footwork. What happens when a friend or family member gives a gift certificate or tells somebody that they need to come in and they make an appointment, but they hate their feet getting worked on? you work on a different extremity, exactly. Um, because the nervous system is saying, for, some, for whatever reason, don't touch me here. I don't like it. Versus somebody comes in and they're like, oh my God, you could rub my feet all day. Don't touch my face so much. Like, don't really like that part. But, you know, I'm all about the feet. Or same thing with the hands or the ears. There's a certain affinity to certain extremities that's unique to each individual. So if somebody has, um, like we're by McDill Air Force Base, so I've had clients who come in without a particular extremity or extremities. So how do you work within that situation? The variety is very helpful, but then also we look at, you know, what's indicated just in terms of preference. Yeah. Do you ever work on alternate, like somebody that was missing the lower part of their leg, would you work on the opposite foot and, yeah. and then the hand? Yeah, I've done that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it, it's really up to them and it's about having a conversation with them in terms of what, what are you expecting. I've had clients that, you know, have said, I want you to work on both hands and just the one foot. Hmm. Or I want you to, I haven't had the phantom limb experience yet. I and have students, yeah, ask you. I have, I have students that have had that experience but where they're, they're actually manipulating a foot that's not there or a hand that's not there. Um, and, and fascinating research has been done with that, that neurological process. So I encourage you to look at the TED Talks and stuff with that. Um, but totally appropriate. Like whatever the client is expecting, at the end of the day, you're a service provider. So provide a service you know, to the client based on their expectation. Um, but when we look at, from a point work perspective, why certain points are present on different extremities or why markers pop up on certain extremities, I'd like you to keep the flavors of the extremities in mind. So from a nerve innervation standpoint, the feet are at the end of horizontal zone five. Does that mean they're chocolate? They're chocolate? What? Well, you said flavors. Yes. So chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, green tea. Um, so don't know where that came from. So the feet are the extension of horizontal zone five which means that they are naturally going to hold greater nerve innervation for the lower body reflexes. Makes sense, yes? But they will also be speaking in a flavor that is more geared towards their sense of security, their foundation, and how they're moving forward. The internal mental emotional meaning of the zone. Because the feet kind of technically belong to that area of the body. So when somebody gets, and this is, this I think plays into the stigma of footwork in our society, um, or if you look at other cultures, like in some cultures, it is considered one of the greatest insults to bare your feet to somebody. You know, the feet tend to hold a very powerful force, a very powerful influence over the body. And I think that that idea of it being in that horizontal zone five, somebody's sense of security, how they're moving forward, their foundation, I think that that's relevant to, to that, that appearance. Versus the hands are an extension of horizontal zone two, right? So we have the nerve innervation that runs through the chest going through the arms and into the hands. The hands are an extension of that zone. That's where they are placed. Yeah. So the hands will always have more of an upper body flavor, but also the mental emotional meaning of feelings and emotions. So I find in my practice that the hands tend to be very emotional extremities. The issues tend to pop up 
and leave very quickly in acute cases, or they tend to be 100% like deep-seated chronic. Um, it's either one or the other. It's a very flighty extremity, the hands. Um, very easy, easier than the feet, because the feet are tougher. They have to be physically. They have to support a body. The hands are all over the place. They're supposed to be mobile. They're supposed to be grabbing and letting go. They're supposed to be, you know, getting paper cuts, and they're right by the heart, so they're very vascular, more vascular than the feet. They don't have to fight gravity to return venous flow. Um, so they're, they're in that space that is a little bit more transient. But at the same time, they do have that proximity to the metaphoric heart as well, that heart center. So we can think of that energy just being a little bit more present in the extremity itself. Does that make sense? A little bit? Okay, so let's talk about face and ears. And this is where it gets kind of interesting is because face and ears are both horizontal zone one, but I'd like you to think of form governing function. So what do the ears do? Like, what do they do physically? Yeah, they, they collect sound, they listen, right? They are receptive in nature. So they are the receivers of horizontal zone one versus the face. When you see somebody, that's the first thing you see. So is that like con it, it is projective, projective. right? Um, the idea, um, the idea of a poker face, you know, needing to hide your projection, um, the needing to cover up, like, I can see it all over your face. You know, that, that kind of language is very ingrained in our society. So when we think of the, the relevance of the extremity and when something happens on the face, it's literally something that we have to face. We cannot look away from it because it is projecting who we are, what we think we will feel, into the world around us. The ears tend to be the opposite. They tend to be more laid back. They tend to be recessive. They tend to be more about absorbing information from our environment. So when we think of like the internal meaning of face versus ears, the face is very much about what we want to say but can't. The ears is very much about the soundtrack of our lives and what's being said around us, the words that we're absorbing. Well, the nose is part of the face and that's receptive too but think of like mucusy discharge like it can also be projective when well, we think that, of, that's the same with your wax true exactly but when we think of like when we communicate we're using facial expression the ears have no expression they have no ability to express vocally visually well, neither does the nose but it's part of the face yeah. the extremity so like that is expressive it's like a yeah, but definitely. I mean, it's yin and yang. Your nose. Yeah, exactly. I Unless mean, you sneeze. <laughs> exactly. So all of that. I mean, little nuances. Just like there, there are more than four, you know, uh, signs of reception. So we want to look at the flavors of the extremities in terms of why, why that one. You know, if somebody's chronically developing ear issues, or if they have a massive keloid on the ear. Or is their a keloid? a keloid is just an overgrowth of scar tissue, okay. um, like things like Google ears, and, and you'll be able to see tons of fun stuff. People who like surgically turn their ears into elf ears, like lots of fun things. All very, all very cool things. So um, when we look at like if a person develops acne in a certain area and we're able to see a pattern in the extremities, like that's an echo. That's something that we're able to validate through the other extremities. But if you're only seeing a symptom in one extremity, ask yourself, what about the flavor of that extremity is the body trying to add to the meaning here? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, that's kind of my thought process as far as what would dictate both treatment? You know, if somebody comes in and they're saying, you know, oh, I love my hands getting worked on, I tend to be, you know, and they're also complaining of shoulder issues, 
they tend to, you know, I'm getting the vibe that they're emotionally closed off or there's some emotional baggage going on, I'll choose the hands over the feet because that seems to be kind of where things are for them. Versus, if, you know, if they're hobbling in and they're like, I just, I, they'll often use the words like, I just can't get over it. I can't move forward. Like, I feel like I'm stuck. I'm in a holding pattern. And that's, that for me is totally zone five. Um, versus, you know, if people are complaining of clogged ears and they have TMJ and they have weird vision stuff, like I'm going to go into the headspace. But ultimately as reflexologist, it's the, the analogy that my favorite analogy right now is, you know, different windows into the same house. It's all the same, you know, you can break in anywhere but it's just, you know, it looks a lot nicer to go through a door rather than a window. Um, you know. So, any other questions, point work? Um, and for everybody watching, I'll, I'll get to questions individually. I'll respond to those later, but... Um, well, point work is basically when you find something in right. general protocol, you just work it. Well, and define work it. And that's the idea of, of so true you, point work. So yeah. you're listening, engaging, and seamless response. Versus, you know, very common in trigger point therapy to go eight and two, eight and two, eight and two, because that's what the textbooks say. Versus instead of intelligently, you know, systems like craniosacral therapy, systems like myofascial work will talk a lot more about listening and feeling. You know, reflexology, I believe some schools will teach the more mechanical, deep pressure, grind into it, treating the body like a meat suit with nerve innervation versus we're having an intelligent communication with the body and asking you to listen, asking you to be an intelligent practitioner as well and engage in that, that dialogue between you and the body. Okay, sound good. Anything else we wanna cover before we wrap up and go to hands? Okay. So let's um, let's take a quick break, and then we'll we'll head out to the tables. Mm -hmm.